All right, what we have in front of the, me right now is the carpal bones and all separated apart. And then just off to the side here, I'll be bringing in a articulated hand. So our first task that we're gonna look at is just figuring out which carpal bone is which. So there's eight carpal bones in total. And one of your objectives may be to identify each bone independently, as well as approximately where they sit and which carpals sit in the proximal row versus the distal row. So I'm gonna be pointing out a few specific landmarks on each one, plus putting it into a row, and then I'll be bringing in the articulated hand just to give you a sense of where each one approximately sits. So you can see we have an orientation of some larger ones and some smaller ones, and a few of them that have some pretty distinct shapes to it. So what I'd like to do is just kind of figure out which ones are the more obvious ones to separate. So this one kind of sticks out a lot to people and it has this very unique shape that's sticking up, which is actually called a hook. So this bone right here and this hook is actually referring to hamate. So this is the hook of hamate. So I'm just going to set this one aside as the hamate. Now we also have a very, very large carpal bone. If I move these around, one of them has the largest shape. You don't always get them in a big group together. You might get just an independent one. So the largest carpal, looking for quite a big one, but it also has this very smooth head to it. So this is easily identifiable as the capitate, one of this kind of center big bone of the entire carpal bones. So I'm gonna set that one off to the side here. Next one that I'm gonna pull out, there's two of them that have kind of a similar shape. They're both convex and concave. Just one of them's clearly larger than the other one. So if I turn these back and forth, you're seeing two concave shapes versus convex shapes. Well, one of them looks just like a small moon. There we go, you can see that nice in the screen right there. And this would be your lunate. So I'm gonna set lunate off to the side. And then the similar bone has that convex and concave with a little bit more to it. They often refer to this one as having a bean shape, and this is your scaphoid bone right here. Okay, so I'm gonna set scaphoid beside lunate up here. All right, so we're down to four. It's getting a little bit to the smaller bones. I'm gonna grab this one on the far right. I'm gonna lift it up for you. It has, again, some size to it, but it has a very unique articular surface. So if you're looking at this, this is actually the saddle joint. So if you can imagine a very, very tiny saddle right here, you have a concave surface if you're running from front to back, but where your legs would hang over on either side, it's actually convex this way. So this is the saddle joint of your thumb, and this bone right here with that joint is your trapezium. So this is trapezium and the saddle joint. So let's set that one up. Okay, we have three bones left, and these just happen to be the ones that often get confused in a lot of sense. The smallest bone, which if you don't have others is sometimes hard to reference, but it is what is known as pisiform or pisiform. Now, what you can look for on a pisiform is one flat spot. So pisiform is quite a round bone, has a lot of attachment and tendon going into it, but it has one facet for triquetrum. So even though you might not have all the other ones, you should see the small bone with a flat spot as pisiform. What I have left are two bones that often get kind of confused. And I'd like to point out that one of them looks like a little shoe, this one. So if you spin it around, it kind of looks like a little boot or a little shoe versus the other one is just a bunch of flat spots. So this little shoe is actually a wedge and it helps create some of the arch of your hand. And this is your trapezoid. So you have a anterior wedge and a dorsal flat surface giving you a little bit more of an arch. So this is trapezoid. We're gonna set that over. Leaving the last carpal bone, which has a bunch of flat spots all over it, a whole bunch of facets. And that's because it articulates with a bunch of different things. So we have lots of articular surfaces, including pisiform. This is triquetrum. So the last carpal bone to set aside is triquetrum. So now that I've named them, I'd like to orient them in a proximal and distal row to make sure that you kind of 
understand that. So I'm going to bring in the hand for us. So we often look at is there's four bones here in the proximal row and then there's four bones in the distal row. So I'm going to go off of the thumb side first. So the first carpal bone that I'm going to be looking for is scaphoid. So scaphoid is in the lateral aspect in the proximal row and right next to it is going to be lunate. So we have scaphoid and lunate. And then we take that final bone that we discussed, triquetrum, which is working our way a little bit more medial, and then the smallest bone, which is pisiform. And this is actually gonna sit on top of triquetrum, but I'm not gonna try to balance in this video, so I'm just gonna set it aside. So we have four carpal bones in the proximal row. Can bring out the hand. We have scaphoid, we have lunate, you have triquetrum, and you have pisiform sitting on top of that triquetrum in a palmar view. So proximal row from lateral to medial. We're going to do the exact same thing with our remaining carpal bones here. So again, starting from the thumb side, we have the trapezium, which is going to be articulating with the thumb. We have trapezoid, and you can see that I tried to accentuate the Z a little bit. We had triquetrum in the proximal row, but we have trapezium and trapezoid, which are going to sit in the distal row. So if you want to think about the Zs are in the distal row, that might help you, which leaves us with two carpal bones. We have capitate, which is going to be sitting in here, and we have hamate, and its hook is the more medial carpal bone here. So again, from lateral to medial, we have trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. So this is our orientation of the proximal and distal rows, and then we're gonna come back and help orient them a little bit better in a different video. All right, we have the hand in front of us now with the carpal bones attached to it. So this is an articulated hand. And we're just going to take a look again at some of those carpal bones and how they are articulating with these metacarpals here and then discuss a little bit about our phalanges. So one thing that's pretty obvious, unless you don't know a whole lot about the hand, is that your thumb is considerably shorter than your other fingers. Well, that is because there's less bones in it. So we know that this is the thumb just because you can see actually three phalanges where the thumb only has two phalanges. So I am looking at the palmer view of the hand here with this being our thumb just to help orient yourself. So we're gonna take a look at a metacarpal. I'm gonna bring us a little bit closer and you can see we got a couple bumps on the sides of these metacarpals as a bigger flat spot over on this end, on the proximal end. This is our posterior surface versus more the palmar surface. We have our palmar surface. We're going to need to have a spot for our tendons to run all the way out. So you can have these nice articular surfaces to try to grab onto and some muscular attachment in those locations. So we have the head being more the distal part of a metacarpal, the shaft, and then the thick and widened part, the proximal end, is known as a base. So for each one of these phalanges and metacarpals, simple rule is it goes base, shaft, head. Base, shaft, head. Base, shaft, head. So for every single metacarpal and phalange, same rules apply. The base of it's the proximal part, the shaft is the thinning part, and then the head is the widened distal portion of it. Okay, so as we're, I'm going to turn this over into a posterior view because I want you just to see where these metacarpals are lining up with their carpal bones. So I'm just going to bring my hand in here as well just to kind of give you a concept of where we're looking. So the carpal bones are in this portion here and these metacarpals are in the hand or kind of what people will call the palm of your hand. That is where your metacarpals are versus your phalanges are your fingers. So just to give you a thought process of where we are. Looking at our first metacarpal, we're gonna talk about the thumb here. So metacarpal number one is going to be here with our proximal phalanx and our distal phalanx, which makes this joint between the trapezium and the thumb known as the carpal metacarpal joint, then between the metacarpal and the proximal phalanx, the metacarpal phalangeal. And finally, this because the proximal and distal, this is known as just an interphalangeal joint. Next, 
we're going to take a look at digit number two, which is metacarpal number two. You can see that it has both articulation with the trapezium as well as with trapezoid. But to get to trapezoid, you really can simply follow the shaft of the second metacarpal towards that trapezoid. So with the finger and each one of these fingers, we have a metacarpal, a proximal, and middle and a distal phalanx. So we have a proximal metacarpal phalangeal joint right in here. We have an proximal interphalangeal joint here, and we have a distal interphalangeal joint here. As we work our way over to finger number three, we're seeing metacarpal number three is going to be articulating here with the capitate. And if I'm just going to turn this over for you, you can see that the head of capitate is more its proximal end and the flat part of it, the more the base of it is the distal part. And that's what's articulating here with the third metacarpal. So this metacarpal phalangeal joint for finger number three. And similarly, the longest finger, we have a metacarpal phalangeal joint, a proximal and a distal interphalangeal joint. And lastly, these fourth and fifth metacarpals are both articulating with the hamate bone. So we can see four and five respectively both articulating with hamate. I'm going to gently turn this over. Here is the hook of hamate that is in the palm of the hand. And then we have the two bases of four and five. And then again, these are the carpal metacarpal joints, metacarpal phalangeal, proximal and distal interphalangeal joint. So as we're looking at all of these carpal bones, it's going to be a little bit tricky. We're going to be pointing out a few landmarks on the palm of the hand just briefly here as we're discussing carpals. So this trapezium has a tubercle that sticks up, which is going to be a main muscle attachment. So the tubercle of trapezium, just proximal to that, there's also a tubercle of the scaphoid. So these two are the lateral aspect attachments for the flexor retinaculum, which is going to be going across, otherwise known as the carpal ligament. A lot of people know what the carpal tunnel is, so this is the medial aspect of this orientation, sorry, lateral aspect of its orientation. And then on the medial side, we have the hook of hamate right in here, as well as the pisiform. So those are the medial attachments to that carpal ligament or flexor retinaculum. So that's basically running across the hand here creating a tunnel that your flexor tendons of your hand runs through. For the most part, these are going to be the, the main attachments to a lot of the muscles into the palm of the hand. There's a little bit off of your capitate as well, but this is going to conclude our discussion of an articulated hand and all of the main carpal bones and their bony landmarks.